Gründer is a professor at the medical faculty Mannheim of the University of Heidelberg, Germany. He is the director of the Department of Molecular Neuroimaging at the Central Institute of Mental Health in Mannheim and also the principal investigator for the suicidal depression study episode that takes place both in Mannheim and here in Berlin at Charité. He is on top one of the partners at the Ovid clinics here in Berlin and one of the CEOs of Ovid Health Systems. The talk tonight that we will be hearing from Gerd Gründer is psychedelics, a solution for the mental health crisis. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you for having me here at this conference. Um, I'm not going to give a science talk. Um, I just want to share with you some thoughts about uh, why I'm doing the, what I'm actually doing, um, what I want to do in the future, what psychedelics could, uh, which role psychedelics could play in the future, how psychiatry probably has to change at least a little bit, and this is also uh, about our culture and. Um, yeah, how we solve the mental health crisis. So, these are my disclosures. And this is the first time that I put the ZE logo and the Ovid logo um, both on one slide. I avoided that in the past. Now, it's, uh, I, I'm, since I made this. Uh, collaboration open. Um, this is the first time. This is the major, major uh, disclosure I have to make. Um, so I'm co-founder of Ovid Health Systems. I'm co collaborating with many industry partners, pharma, big pharma companies, but that won't play a role tonight. So I would like to start with uh, Paul. Just be honest, please. Who here in this room believes that psychedelics could be the solution of the mental health crisis? Okay. Some people. Uh, who does not believe that psychedelics are the solution? So probably 50-50, maybe a little bit more on the no side. I like to convince the proponents that they are wrong. That's uh, um, my, my basic message for the next 30 minutes or so. So the, 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 the people who believe that psychedelics could be the solution for the mental health crisis are, have, uh, have good company for example, here I found this talk, uh, th this podcast here by Michael Pollan. Could psychedelics solve the mental health crisis? Um, it's on YouTube. It's a podcast on YouTube. And you, if you, if you t Google mental health crisis and solution, you find many hits. And I put, put down here just a few. Can illegal drugs solve Canada's mental health crisis? Question mark. LSD could be the key to alleviating the mental health crisis if government allows it. Psychedelic psychiatry, a revolution set to transform our mental health. Can LSD cure our pandemic anxiety? Pandemic anxiety. So uh, the mental health crisis, which was caused by the pandemic, the corona pandemic, MindMed is spending big to find out. And then there's a lot about investments and companies Sell, solve our mental health crisis. Psychedelics, a game changer in mental health? Question mark. Another game changer here in mental health. The companies tackling a global health crisis, a global health crisis, 
And then I like this one, anxiety, depression and addiction at all time highs, which psychedelic medicine companies, med medicines companies can solve the crisis. This is my favorite. <laughs> can we solve the climate crisis? Anybody here who believes that we can solve the climate crisis, at least one? Okay, a, a few. <laughs> My son up there. <laughs> and here we treat the mental health crisis and the climate crisis at the same time. I'm, I'm pretty sure if we count on psychedelics to solve the climate crisis, the planet will burn like hell. There, there are, of course, uh, good data to believe that psychedelics on a population level could improve mental health. And uh, one of these studies is shown here. That this is a study um, by the Johns Hopkins group. They um, looked for lifetime use in 190,000 US, US citizens and um, ask them for their psychological distress and suicidality. And I put just down here just a few uh, numbers. So th this is lifetime use of various uh, drugs. And here is past month psychological distress. And as you can see here, there's only one drug. This is classical psychedelic use. Uh, which decreases past month psychological di distress. There are several drugs that increase psychological distress, like tranquilizers, or, or this is not caus causation, this is association. So I, sh I shouldn't say uh, that these drugs increase psychological distress, but they are associated with more uh, uh, psychological stress. And this is a, a past year suicide attempt, and again, Lifetime classical, classic psychedelic use decreases past year suicide attempt. And there's no as association for most of the other compounds except for THC and um, pain relievers. Here ends the data which really supports the view that the mental health crisis um, can be solved with psychedelics. This is an article from the New York Times in March 2019. More than 150 Americans died from alcohol and drug-induced fatalities and suicide in 2017. So this, uh, this article referred to the data from 2017. Uh, so there was a... They, they talked about a record in the U.S., and uh, the, the numbers even increased in the following year. So here the, here's the data for 2018. The numbers even increase. Suicide rates, this is suicide rates. The numbers increase until 2018. For the last two years, the numbers decreased a little bit. So the trend is plateauing or de decreasing. But there was a uh, very high number at in 2018. This is opiate overdose. There are three waves of, uh, um, o of overdose death or, or overdoses, deaths uh, um, according to opiate overdoses. The first wave be began 20 years um, f uh, earlier. This is the second wave, and we have a third wave. And if you compare the numbers here, there's about a five-fold increase in death due to opioid overdoses in the U.S. Does anybody really believe that we could decrease these numbers by feeding the people with psychedelics? I will show you some numbers that uh, are really 
pointing in the different direction. The trend, um, this is again the New York Times article, which I just cited. The trend most likely has social causes, lack of access to mental health care, economic stress, loneliness and despair, the opioid epidemic, and the unique difficulties facing small-town America. These are serious problems that require long-term solutions. This is all about culture. This is about how we live together, how we work together, how we communicate together. This is not about a drug that could provide solutions to all these problems here. But this, again in the New York Times, a few weeks earlier, the author can we stop the can we stop suicides was the article um, the the headline and the solution was ketamine ketamine might be the solution i was really surprised when i saw this article a ketamine any drug the solution for this increase in suicides let's have a look at suicide rates in children. Children kill themselves, unfortunately. The, 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 the numbers are relatively low, but children kill themselves. And what you, what you see here, the, these are suicide rates in the US for children aged 10 to 14. And we see this sharp increase here. Here we see a decrease uh, until 2007. And then we see a threefold increase, especially in girls. Young girls have a dramatic increase and, and this trend continued for a couple of more years. Um, the girls, young, especially young girls, 10 to 14 years old, have a dramatic increase in suicide rates. How can that be? What, what, what could be the explanation? The, f f Facebook, Facebook was launched in 2004. And this is not just my idea that Facebook is the cause for increasing suicides in young girls. This is really um, a matter of debate in science. This is a... Uh, um, a editorial published two years ago, increasing suicide rates in early adolescent girls in the United States and the equalization of sex disparity in suicide. Usually, uh, suicide rates are higher in males than in females. And especially, in, you saw the numbers. Um, the need to investigate the role of social media and the authors in this article come to the conclusion, these findings suggest that the possible role of social media is the sharp, in the sharp increases in suicidality among early adolescent girls is an urgent public health issue that merits further investigation. So that, that's very plausible. At least one, it's not that they are saying Facebook leads girls to kill themselves. But it's the culture behind this development. This is from the World Happiness Report, which was published in 2019. You can find it on the internet. It's very interesting to read, read all the, the, the texts behind the world happiness. World happiness is also about mental health. And... Jean Twenge, uh, a psychologist from California, San Diego University, she, she's concerned about these de developments for a couple of years now. She wrote this uh, chapter in the World Happiness Report, The Sad State of Happiness in the United States and the Role of Digital Media. And she's, she says, the rise of digital media and the fall of everything else. This is the rise of The rise of digital, can you hear me? 
the rise of digital media, and this is the fall of everything else. This is the fall of sleep, the fall of in-person social interaction, and the fall of happiness. Does anybody here of the proponents, the psychedelic proponents, believe that we should, uh, that it is possible to decrease suicide rates in girls 10 to 14 years old by feeding them with psychedelics? This is a nature editorial. A world of depression. So this is a description of the mental health crisis. Each of these bars here represents a country. Germany is somewhere here. The US is somewhere here. Here's Germany. The US is somewhere here. Do you, can, can you see from the back which country this one is? With a very high bar. Uh, uh, bar. 20, 22.5%. 22 these are prevalences. So 22.5% of the population of this country here suffer from depression. This is Afghanistan. And the text says, this war-torn country report, reports the world's highest prevalence of depression and yet it is among the, last, the least equipped to deal with it. Conflict is a well-established risk factor for depression, as are child sexual abuse and domestic violence. Does anybody really believe that we can decrease prevalence, depression prevalence in Afghanistan by sending them some containers of mushrooms? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> let's talk about poverty and mental health. Let's talk about parental unemployment and lack of education. Let's talk about children again, because I think nobody really wants to feed psychedelics to children. And I'm really talking about children, not about young adults. Parental unemployment and lack of education are risk factors for mental, for, for mental diseases. This is data from Finland. We know that parental unemployment and lack of education are uh, problems very widely distributed in countries like the US, where social or socio-economic disparity is large. By the way, in Germany, it's not much better. This is from Finland. So the, the Scandinavian countries have very good social uh, systems. And so I, I took data to show you from a Scandinavian uh, country on purpose, because here the socioeconomic differences or dis disparities are smaller. This is um, depression prevalence in Finnish schoolgirls, depending on the socioeconomic status. The, the, there are a, a lot of data in that paper. I, I put together just the two extremes high education. Employed, so the parents are have high educational level are and are employed, and here is low education unemployed. Both parents are unemployed. Look just on the uh, prevalence, depression prevalence in percent for severe severe depression, two to three percent, slightly increasing over the years over this decade, and this is low education unemployed the prevalence is much higher and it's increasing. So here we have a widening gap. So the, the gap between depression, severe depression prevalence between children from w with a high socioeconomic status compared to low socioeconomic status is widening. 
And it's even more impressive in boys. Here you see severe depression, high education unemployed, uh, high education employed, very low numbers, not increasing, stable. And here, low education unemployed, here you have an eightfold risk for severe depression if your parents are unemployed and have a low education. And again, do we really believe, or anybody here believe, that these problems can be solved with psychedelics? Yes? Okay, we can discuss that. that that's, that's interesting. Um, that's a good starting point for the, for the round table later. Let's talk, and, and that's also, um, I, I think, very, very important. Let's not talk about mental wellness. This is not about mental wellness. This is a, 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 about mental health. This is for the rich, high-educated, employed, but we should talk about mental health for everybody. Um, the approach to improve mental health of people with a drug was described by Aldous Huxley in Brave New World in 1932. This was a dystopia. This was not meant to be the solution for future societies. And I picked one citation from, from this book describing Soma. Soma is a solution for feeling unwell. Now, such is progress. The old men work, the old men copulate, the old men have no time, no leisure from pleasure, not a moment to sit down and think, or oh, if ever by some unlucky chance such a crevice of time should yawn in the solid substance of their distractions. There's always Soma, delicious Soma, half a gram for, half holi for a half holiday, a gram for a weekend, two grams for a trip to the George's East, three for a dark eternity on the moon. Returning whence they find themselves on the other side of the crevice, safe on the solid ground of daily labor and distraction, scampering from feely to feely, from girl to pneumatic girl, from electromagnetic golf course to... This is the approach of feeling well by administering a drug. I think that's really not the solution. Um, now, some people here now might think, why is he so negative? Um, I'm trying to put um, the, the use of psychedelics in a broader cultural context. And of course, I'm convinced that with these compounds we have tools which provide a different approach to mental health. And that's what I want to show you in the last couple of minutes of my talk. I want to, to start with this uh, uh, very interesting study which was published by Peggy Mason and her group. Peggy Mason is a neurobiologist at the University of Ch Chicago. Ten years ago in, in Science, she published a paper that shows that midazolam reduces empathy in rats. And I would like to show you the first one and a half minutes of her YouTube video because she, she really is the best one to explain what, what, what you found. This follows up on, on a basic finding that we published five years ago. And that is that rats will help other rats. And that's really quite amazing. We, what we really wanted to do here is to go beyond the, the finding of helping and really 
dig down as to why. What is the motivating factor? What's necessary? What drives this rat? To go- what we hypothesized is that they were doing it because they not only recognized the trap rat's distress, but they actually caught it. They, they, they caught it. So they actually felt distressed themselves. And if that is right, then if we block the rat from feeling distress, he won't open. And that's exactly what happened. So as we gave a drug called midazolam, it's a benzodiazepine, it's the type of drug it is, and its action is an as an anxiolytic. That means it blocks anxiety. So we give the, the free rat midazolam, and what we see is they don't, they don't open. So that's really amazing. In the context of, of today's society, which is a highly medicated society, where lots of people are taking psychoactive drugs that might blunt their experience of negative affect, our results would suggest that that will also blunt helping. Yeah. Um, very, very interesting study. So midazolam is a benzodiazepine. It's not an antidepressant. That, I found no studies on antidepressants in that, in that specific model. It would be interesting to see uh, how antidepressants work in that model. But I found this study in humans. Um, and that is with antidepressants. It's an fMRI study. I, I skipped the fMRI part. I just report here the um, behavioral part. The subjects, these were 29 patients with major depressive disorder and 35 healthy controls, were shown video clips with uh, subjects um, who were exposed to loud noise. And they were told that this is a treatment for tinnitus. And then, uh, so it, it, it was communicated as a treatment. And they saw these video clips with the suffering subject. And they were uh, asked how unpleasant was the treatment for the patient and how unpleasant was it for you to watch the video. This is, uh, and we heard this uh, from, from Katrin, uh, cognitive empathy is this one. How unpleasant was the treatment for the patient? This is cognitive empathy. Affective empathy is the, how unpleasant was it for you to watch the video for yourself? That's empathy, aff- affective empathy. And uh, the patients, the, at the beginning, at baseline, these patients with depression were untreated, unmedicated. And then they were treated for, I think, three months, and then they did the same task again. And the fMRI part is very much in line with what I report here for the behavior. This is cognitive empathy, no change, nothing happens. But the, and that's again, very much in line with, uh, with what uh, Katrin just reported. Um, this is affective empathy. And you see that uh, regardless of the treat, uh, of whether the treatment was communicated as being ineffective or effective, the patients with MDD with depression had a decrease in affective empathy in both conditions. There was no change in the healthy controls because they didn't take the antidepressants. So uh, the conclusion of that paper was it's. Antidepressant treatment that reduces empathy in patients with depression. And that's what we see in the clinic, uh, what, what has been reported over, over the years. It's called emotional blunting with antidepressants, especially with serotonergic antidepressants. And that is really understudied. There's not much, liter- not much literature on emotional blunting uh, with antidepressants. This is a very interesting study. So this is showing that empathy is decreasing. And um, the, the question by Peggy Mason was, 
in the highly over-medicated or medicated society, 5% of all, uh, all Germans take an antidepressant and a couple of more in the United States, does this decrease in empathy might change the society. What we do with psychedelics is very different. This is our treatment room in the Central Institute of Mental Health in Mannheim. Here we treat patients with psilocybin. And um, it was really a milestone when we started to treat our first patient on July 13th. Um, I did this together with um, Lea Mertens. Lea Mertens is also in the audience. I cannot see her. There she is. <laughs> um, she's not the only one uh, working with me. Uh, my whole team is here. I'm very proud that my whole team is here, not only the therapists, but uh, the, some of the student assistants. So this is, this is a very enthusiastic team. Ten people he, having he, he, here is really great. So the people are very enthusiastic. Um, two days ago, the two of us, um, Le Lea and I treated the first patient on July 13th. We, I think we will never forget that day. Um, two days ago, we treated a patient um, which... A, a, and the experience we had was um, really just very different from everything what I did over the last decades. Um, After about two, two hours, two hours after the ingestion of the capsule, the patient said, so suddenly said, I think I got the placebo. And then she began laughing. <laughs> and then she began crying. And she didn't stop crying for the next three to four hours. And when she began crying, I looked to Lea, and I saw that Lea was crying, and I was crying. Um, so, this is very, very different from what you usually do in psychiatry. I hope... I I treated a couple of thousand patients conventionally. Let's call it conventionally over the, over the years. I never held the hand of a patient for two hours and cried with a patient. So this was, there was empathy in the room. This was uh, not only a very important experience for the patient, but for the three of us. So this is a very different treatment approach that we are now doing here. Um, and I'm glad that, that, that I'm being part of this, and I, um, I'm glad that there are so many people around me in the team who, uh, who can share this experience. After the, uh, w when the effect of the drug slowly ended, the patient said, this was the most impressive experience in my life. And this woman was a middle-aged woman from Afghanistan. And um, Usually, you, you, you just read this in, in newspapers or in books, in Michael Pollan's books, for example. But here it's now really happening. So this is uh, 
the, these are moments of happiness for the therapists. Um, but this is a, a, a different treatment approach, a different approach of treating patients. It's about emotion, not suppressing negative emotions, but allowing emotion, allowing suffering, feeling the emotion with the patient, feeling the suffering with the patient. It's, it's, a, it's a different approach to mental health. But I'm pretty sure that this will not solve all our problems. We, we cannot... Um, uh, uh, psychedelics, is, for, for me, is a kind of metaphor for a change in mindset. Openness, connectedness, empathy. This is the mindset we need if we want to save the planet. But it's... Uh, you, you cannot... You cannot save the planet by treating Donald Trump or Javier Bolsonaro with LSD. Bolsonaro won't stop burning the jungle by if you just treat him with LSD. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerd, for this roller coaster that you've taken us on. <laughs> um, we are now going to go into the panel discussion soon, but I have been asked to also come back to our online audience for questions. And perhaps we could do that now. Amy and Clara, would you have a question for Gerd from the online oh. audience? There's a question from Cairo Bashi, and uh, it says, our mental health crisis seems to stem from a world changing more rapidly than our ability to adapt. Uh, for example, more socialization, uh, less richness in connection. Can psychedelics and the plasticity and perspectives they produce help us keep pace? Um. <laughs> I would repeat myself. I don't think so. I don't think that we that we uh, can, uh, uh, b b by increasing our brain's plast plasticity with a drug, uh, that that we can adapt to uh, changes in technology. I think we have to uh, change our approach how we use technology. Uh, we we have to ask the question: Is technology? The, or, uh, or consumption, more consumption, more technology, are these the solutions for the problems we face? And I don't think so. So it, it, it's not, it's not uh, the solution to, to um, increase our biological fitness. I don't, I don't think that this is the solution. 